Before I go on with this short history, let me make a general observation. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposite ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. One should, for example, be able to see things as hopeless and yet be determined to make them as otherwise. No, not a good lead. Used by F. Scott Fitzgerald, 1936, The Crack Up. Let's try again. Well, yes, and here we go again. But before we get to the work, as it were, I want to make sure I know how to cope with this elegant typewriter. Nope. Hunter S. Thompson, the great shark hunt, used it in 1979. What we need here is an original moment. There are really very few of those. I had one once in 1987. My job was to design a writing assessment for kindergarten and first grade children in the Fort Worth school systems. Some of the children had been taught by a writing-to-read approach developed by John Henry Martin. Others had been taught by a writing-as-process approach informed by James Gray in the National Writing Project. What we needed was to make a kind of a comparison between the two groups. And yes, I know what you're thinking about the limits of this kind of research, but I was in my ambitious 30s, and I was willing to try all kinds of assessment experiments. Anyway, what we needed to do this experiment was a good set of writing prompts. My original moment, I suggested we have kids write about eating ice cream. The result, the line papers filled up with voices and writing and drawing. The kids wrote about the kinds of ice cream they liked and the kinds they didn't. They read about those they ate ice cream with, including moms and friends and dogs. There was comedy, the sheer delight of two scoops appearing when you'd ordered one. There was tragedy, the Texas sun and its cruel melting ability. The kids just couldn't say enough. In Walden, Henry David Thoreau tells his readers this story. I long ago lost a hound, a bay horse, and a turtle dove. I'm still on that trail. Many are the travelers I have spoken concerning them, describing their tracks and what calls they answer to. I have met one or two who had heard the hound, the tramp of the horse, and even seen the dove disappear behind a cloud, and they seemed as anxious to recover them as if they had lost them themselves. In thinking about my singular original moments so long ago, I realized that ever since I've been searching for those joys that the Fort Worth children brought to their writing, the sheer exuberance and delight in voice, rendered on the page in writing and in drawings to be understood together. In working over the past decade at New Jersey Institute of Technology with my colleagues, I've found again that joy. Together, we've witnessed a new enthusiasm for writing when that writing is performed in a mediated environment. Digital images and recorded voices, text that sings on the page to accompany images, words splash on the screen with light. My colleagues and I stop each other in the halls and say as if we'd found a new poem by Gerald Stern, hey, you got to see this. In many ways, that's what this podcast series is about. The message is simple. You got to see this. You got to think about this. But to think about writing in a mediated environment, you also got to think in new ways. For example, none of what I'm going to present in the five acts of this series is based on what we know as the essay. I'll deal more with the essay as we go. But for now, I want you to imagine that, along with no positions, possessions, I wonder if you can, no need for greed or hunger or brother tune of man, that kind of thing. Imagine that the essay is no longer with us, just gone, another hot, hot fire, come down to smoke and ash, with even the ashes blown away. If we can still retain the ability to function, then we can get to the work. With those Fort Worth kids, Let's imagine that ice cream is at once about itself and about many other things. Let's call those other things allegorical representations suggested by the signifier of, say, a pint of Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia. Let's begin then with the allegory. We have really no better guide to the allegory than Angus Fletcher. An allegory, the theory of a symbolic mode Fletcher reminds us of the truly devious nature of allegory. In the simplest terms, allegory says one thing and means another. It destroys the normal expectations we have about language, that our words mean what they say. Further, the allegorical mode is present everywhere, in romances and westerns and political satire and apocalyptic visions and detective stories and podcasts. Because it is pervasive, allegory thus serves, as Fletcher claims, 
major social and spiritual needs. Why? Because it makes us think and think again. It makes us extend our ideas beyond the bourgeois and boring fixed hierarchies that constrain us. Allegory makes us imagine. As this kindergarten student did, note the writing sample on the left, when asked to write a story about a magic hat. Before I went to Texas, I spent a happy summer as a part-time hourly employee at the Educational Testing Service in Princeton, covering staff during their vacation days. I had the fortune to work with Trudy Conlon in performing the first ever assessment of the Writing to Read program, which is why I had the sheer nerve to say I could replicate the assessment design in Florida. On the left is a writing sample from a five-year-old child. The hat is provided an icon of experience in which readers can imagine magic hat stories themselves. Imagine Plato, Roland Barthes, Louise Rosenblatt, Stanley Fish. Imagine them all smiling together at this notion. There's prompting from the writer. I wish I was on the moon. I wish I had a car. I wish I had a garden. Celestial transportation. Pastoral aspects of life all are covered. But the central image here is the hat. Here, the child seems to be saying, is that magic hat itself. Drawing it, I can conjure up wishes. You can do this conjuring too. See the hat. If readers do not see what might be expected, then that is their failure of imagination. Deal with it. There's no narrative, description, exposition, or argument. Only an Eden existing with no mode of discourse in sight. Present only is the evocative. It is what is absent that is key. On the right-hand side of the page is a second image, one from a graduate student e-portfolio that Nancy Coppola acquires at NJIT of all the students enrolled in our MS and Professional and Technical Communication program. It was created 22 years after the Magic Hat. If we take a look at the portfolio under writing and editing, for example, we can find that the student has exhibited mastery of a technological grant proposal. Let's give this just a moment to load, because the students all load in Adobe. And here we have a proposal to the City Police Department in Astoria for a particular kind of proposal, an upgraded technology idea to improve data terminals, improving the off to saving, and community policing efforts in that community. And an extensive proposal follows. We can also look at the student portfolio under the idea of technology and see that the student is also has enormous web capability in planning and designing here online education module for instruction learning how it works and stories of can distance education learn for you with scrolls that take you through a narrative adventure there now the point I'm making about the portfolio the e-portfolios here the student seems to be saying as a repertoire of my work. Providing it, I can conjure up a defined portrait of my abilities. Here is evidence of my work with others, my ability to make informed choices by means of my knowledge of classical and contemporary rhetorical theory. And here is my ability to design documents and to use technology in the service of a variety of communication contexts. There are, of course, differences between the two icons on the left and on the right. Those differences are vast. The differences stem from a single cause. Our graduate student, Carol Savino, has a vast repertoire of choices, and the five-year-old has only the one at hand. Thus, our graduate student has very precise concepts of rhetorical form and audience, of evaluative strategies, those that ensure message reception, a metacognitive reflection on those strategies. Carol is what we want the five-year-old to grow up to be 22 years later. Yet if we ask Carol how she came to be what she is, she would say that her experiences with computer-mediated communication led her back to the sense of wonder and exuberance she remembered as a child. Indeed, it's well worth it to look at Carol's portfolio and listen under the rhetoric link to the work entitled Mutual Moments Photo Essay. It is there that she talks about, and yes, there's voice recording there, communication is a vehicle of recollection as a means of expressing exuberance aesthetically. There is then a significant link between the two screen captures, the presence of aesthetics. The hat on the left, the digital signature on the right, both have iconographic significance. The child provides the hat, and you may wish upon it. The graduate student provides a digital signature, 
and from it you may understand the components, the symbolic significance of hand, pen, disc, monitor, keyboard, and mouse that constitute the whole. There are those elements of communication that connect, that are valuable and worthy of our attention, and we had better understand those elements when we look to context. Boy, what a difference eight years makes. We have a statement from Brian Hewitt in 1996, leader in the field of writing assessment. And we could see that in 1996, the modernist tendency was present. The electronic portfolio would be, well, a file cabinet. It would allow management. But that was before the radical transformation of the internet, of in-home broadband connections and compressed file sizes. It was a time when AOL was wrapping so risedly that four years later, it would take first place in the media conglomerate known as AOL Time Warner. When Brian was writing, Windows 95 was hot. Just eight years later, the technology had so advanced that Kathleen Blake Yancey, take a look at that quote on the right-hand side of the screen, would call for a web-sensible portfolio, such as the one from Carol Savino, that both inhabits and transforms the digital medium itself. If in our allegorical journey through communication and its forms in this podcast series, we deepen our concepts of image and judgment, so too must we deepen our ideas about conceptualization. In preparing for this series, my colleague Ken Ronkowitz, a manager of media instructional technology here at NGIT by day and a blogger extraordinaire of serendipity 35 by night, reminded me that even my title for this series was not original. I do note, however, that Richard Andrews has a question mark after his title, the end of the essay. I mine and far as, of course, a period, if not an exclamation point. Yet Andrews and I are on the same page. We both think that writing academic essays is nothing more than an elaborate game in which many are not as fortunate as Carol Savino to have survived. As well, both Andrews and I hold that there are other forms of student expression that are valuable and that it's high time that we attend to such forms, especially to the development of personal voice. It is indeed such personal voice that we find in the elegant essay by Paul Heiker in his 2006 article, 20 Years In, an Essay in Two Parts. Heichel begins by reviewing the best that has been written and thought about the essay with excerpts from Montaigne, we'll get to him in Act 3, to E.B. White, to Joseph Ward Crouch, to contemporary writers in the field of composition such as William Zeiger. Heichel even offers a two-column chart with one column representing the article, clearly a modernistic reporting form concretizing that which is out of directed and advocating the monologic, and the essay, clearly a postmodern form that is in a directed, embracing the dialogic. Indeed, Heigl's columns will remind readers of similar famous columns offered by Ihab Hassan in The Culture of Postmodernism in 1985. And midway in the article, Heigl realizes the truth, that extremes do not hold in the real world of writing, and at the end of the day, the columns must simply live side by side. Heigl concludes that students should have exposure to all forms of discourse, rhetoric, poetic, and electronic, written, oral, digital, and multimodal, Literary, popular, and technical discourse, personal, academic, and civic discourse, individual, collaborative composition, syntactic and paratactic organization, critical thinking, reading, writing, speaking, listening. Indeed. But the 500-pound gorilla, the essay, is nevertheless still in the room, breathing heavily, making threatening gestures. What would that room look like with a gorilla not there? That is a world that is upon us, Jeff Rice tells us in the rhetoric of cool composition studies in the new media, a 2007 analysis that provides an alternative perspective for composition studies by providing six rhetorical principles conducive to cool. Cora, approbation, juxtaposition, commutation, nonlinearity, and imagery. Rice correctly believes that it is difficult for us in the academy to imagine non-digital world. The problem is the way we imagine writers and writing. If classroom writing is the only kind of writing we imagine, Rice tells us, then our perception of writing will remain narrower in scope. We must, Rice convincingly argues, allow the cool writer to emerge. What we need are writers who understand how media shapes our world, our ability to communicate within that world. Where, he asks, is the curriculum whose outcomes speak to rhetorical gestures. Where in all of this, I'll ask, is Miles Davis. Where's Moon Dreams? (laughs) 
At the Research Network Forum, a forum of the Conference on College Composition and Communication, we're discussing these issues and much else. So if these podcasts interest you, join us there and in New Orleans on April 2nd, 2008 for the Research Network Forum and the Four Seas Conference hosted this year by RNF founder Charles Bazelman. Well, what's next? The, the figure on the left by symbolist painter Odilon Rodon is entitled The Eye Like a Strange Balloon Moves Toward Infinity. Angus Fletcher includes this charcoal as a plate in his treatment of allegory, an example of cosmos, a term that signifies a universe in rank and hierarchy. However, as Fletcher observes, more and more phenomena have to be crowded into the universe that science keeps discovering, while the process of discovery is itself a sort of overall expansion, thus the definition of cosmos has to expand with knowledge itself. And the point? Hierarchy, it's just not as important as perspective. Modern life demands that we see multiplicity in place of unitary systems. Such are the themes we'll address as we move through the next four podcasts. In Act 2, we'll review some of the work that our students have performed at NGIT, work that is congruent with Jeff Rice's conjuring of the spirit of cool. In Act 3, we'll come to terms with the tradition that has locked that 500-pound gorilla, the essay, in the room in the first place and suggest some ways to let the beast out, and us as well. In Act 4, we will address the ever-elusive aspect of accountability for mediated communication, and will demonstrate that its, outs its outcomes can be assessed in a valid and reliable fashion. In Act 5, we'll offer a Burkean analysis of the ideas we're suggesting in this series, a series of final thoughts on the meaning and impact of writing in a mediated environment will come then in Act 5. Now, this then is the lineup. With James Taylor, we've lined them all up. And as the occasion arises, as you'll see, we'll happily step out of line. Take some hands, somebody line them up, line them all up, line them up, line them all up, onto the line.